As you can tell, I bought a cheering section with me today. <laughs> ah, well, good, af good, good, good afternoon, good morning, it's still morning, good morning. Um, yes, I am a campus pastor. I have worked for 10 years as a campus pastor at Grand Rapids Community College, and in this past year, we moved our ministry over to Grand Rapids, um, Grand, <laughs> one of those days, to Grand Valley State University. Uh, and uh, we're getting started there. We're laying our foundation. It's very exciting. Any prayers and support you can give for us, that'd be fantastic. Uh, probably should start off by saying um, I am a person with disabilities myself. Uh, if you remember when I spoke here last year, uh, I am deaf. I have processing disorder, which makes me kind of like an autistic person. Uh, and also, I have learning, all sorts of learning disabilities. So as you can imagine, college was a huge challenge for me, just as it is for anybody who is, who is in college. And there are things to think about, things to consider. Uh, it was fun for me, but it was also difficult. There are social problems. I am not a terribly social person, uh, as anybody can tell you. I am so introverted that it takes a lot to get me out of my shell, and that's a common story that I hear with students with disabilities. Uh, they're not extroverts, or, although there are some. Um, but there are social issues. Uh, studying, the academics. I can't tell you how many times I had to retake classes uh, uh, in order to pass. Uh, I was on academic probation, which is the college level version of being in special ed classes. Uh, so there's a number of challenges that I can empathize with and any of the students that uh, come to us, come to our ministry, at Jabez Ministries at GVSU, uh, I can empathize and we can sympathize with that. And so what I'm presenting today is the reflections of a disabled campus pastor. I'm gonna be talking, I'm casting kind of a broad net I'll be talking, speaking to everybody here, but to pastors, to campus pastors, to students, to parents, with, and to, to people with disabilities in general. These are some things that I have learned after doing this for 11 years that I think I can share with you. Um, one thing, uh, when you get to college, it's a completely different game. You're in a public school, or even a Christian school, parochial school, you're covered under what's known as the 304 law, which means the school is obligated to help you go through whatever accommodations you might need. You don't, they don't need your permission, they just do it. If you need special education, you need tutoring, they're obligated to take care of that. Once you get to college, however, you're not covered under that anymore. You're now covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act the ADA. That means you have to advocate for yourself. So it adds an additional challenge to, to going to college. It adds an additional challenge to when you, you know, for a person with disabilities, adulting is impossible. So now you have that challenge. You, you have to advocate for yourself. So hopefully a few things that I'll be talking about, the second part of this, will give you those tools needed Here's some data that I thought would be interesting to share with you. Um, play. Ah, okay. uh, I should also say, uh, there's a difference between going to a community college, which is a two-year school, and a four-year college. In a two-year school, you learn at your own pace, it's a bit more cost-effective. They tend to take cater towards going into trades rather than an actual academic career, whereas four-year schools that take longer, uh, and for people with disabilities, it's longer than the usual four years. Uh, I did five, and then I did like nine for my master's degree. Uh, and then you can move on from grad school from there. Here's some data. For undergraduates, undergraduate degree, bachelor degree, 80.6% of 
uh, students without disabilities. That leaves 11.9% students with disabilities. Graduate studies, students without disabilities, 88.1%. With students with disabilities, 11.9%. We have work to do. You're out there, you have gifts. You have stuff you can share with people. You have a community and a career you can build. Look at these statistics. Very few people with disabilities go to college. And they're capable of doing so. Problem is, is, you know, we need accommodation. The majority of students with disabilities enrolled in college went to a four-year institution, 69%. Whereas that leaves 28% went to a two-year college. Students, uh, one-third of those students informed their college that they had disabilities. One third. That's two thirds who didn't. 13 and 12 percent of the students inform their, current, their colleges of current disabilities. And there's even a number of people, 37 uh, percent, who said that their disabilities didn't bother them while they were in college. I'm still trying to work that one out. That means that they toughed it up they decided not to incur, not to, to get, seek accommodation for their disabilities. There we go. Uh, use of college academic support. Uh, to your college, uh, more likely to take remedial courses at, to, as compared to students at a four-year college. 44% of the students who reported disabilities at a two-year college took, an, took remedial courses compared to the 21% who didn't at a, at a four-year college, who did at a four-year college. A difference of remedial course of taking college level is also present in students who do not report a disability, 43%. So we have these statistics here in the uh, Rather interesting. Now, now I'm going to get to the theological part. I am a pastor after all. And I apologize for filing some of those numbers up. One of my disabilities is dyscalculia. So I have some trouble with memory numbers and doing things sequentially. So if anybody wants any of those slides that I flubbed up on, uh, just give me an email and I'll send them to you. Uh, but here's, here's a place where I'm a little bit more confident. Uh, what are the problems? Well, people don't understand disabilities. We've been talking about that this entire conference. And with that comes with students not really asking for any kind of an accommodation on campus. You know, it's only one third ask for accommodations. That's not a lot. And there's no singular approach. I know several people on the autism spectrum not a single one of them are the same. Not a single one of them are alike. I know several people who are deaf like myself, but not alike at all. So a lot of times the problem becomes it's no, there's no blanket approach to uh, offering pastoral care, offering support and community to people with disabilities. It's, it's just very, very difficult. So schools are inadequate. Pastors are not trained largely. It's getting better. It's getting better, but it still has a long way to go. A lot of seminaries still don't have disability, uh, ministry to disability people, disabled people in the, in the course lineup. It's getting better, but it still needs a long way to go. So what does that leave the student with disabilities? When you have a campus pastor who doesn't know, like I have experienced at GVSU, when you have campus pastors who have no experience with people with disabilities, and more and more people with disabilities are going to college. Well, here's some, here's some help, I hope. I've been a campus pastor since 2012. I worked in group homes for 20 years before that. And I started this ministry back in 2012. I was gun ho I was your typical activist. I was gonna get justice for everybody with disabilities. 
And then I met these people, my cheering squad. <laughs> and they made me a much better pastor. Why? Because I was listening to their stories. I was listening to the things they had to say. And I realized something. If you take a look at that verse I have up there from 2 Samuel, that's the life of Mephibosheth. Okay, I just probably kind of put it in a nutshell. But the first verse talks about how David want, just wanted to do something nice for a person in Jonathan's family who he made a pledge with as a brother. He just wanted to do something nice. So Mephibosheth is recommended because he's lame in both feet. He goes to Ziba, who's the chief slave to King Saul, and he says, Ziba is crippled in both feet. There's two different words there. There's two different words. David uses a positive word. He says somebody who has an affliction. Whereas Ziba uses the word nikah, which means he's a cripple, which is a word that nobody likes hearing anymore but it's a negative term. He's somebody who's broken. And when that said to me, when I was studying that in seminary, the problem of dealing with people with disabilities goes back to the beginning of time. We always like to separate the us and them, and that's what they're doing here. But what's the important thing? The very, very important thing comes in 1 Samuel 19, 13, 1930. He hears all of this from David. Nobody ever says anything to Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth doesn't say anything until chapter 19. And Ziba is about ready to take all of Mephibosheth's possessions because he's lied to the king. If you're familiar with the story, he lies to the king and David gives all of, his, all Ziba, all of Mephibosheth's possessions to Ziba. And nobody asks Mephibosheth anything. So finally, David and Mephibosheth finally meet up in chapter 19. He says what he's going to do. And, he's, and he realizes, and David realizes he, he, he messed it up. So he says, okay, I tell you what, instead, Ziba's not going to get everything. He's going to get half, and you get the other half. Here's the important story. Because of Mephibosheth's character, even though he was a person with a limp, victim of circumstance, he says, I'm just glad my Savior's back. Let him have it all. Give it to him. These are the only words he says in the whole text. Character. And what that says to me is we're looking at an issue um, we're looking at you know we're people. We've been talking about this whole conference. We're created in the image of God. We're just like everybody else. We, we, in Jabez Ministries, we work, we work with the idea that everyone's disabled. We've all got issues. We've all got our problems. And dealing with people with disabilities and prejudice with people with disabilities goes way back. It's almost hardwired into our DNA. So how do we get ourselves out of that? Well, Mephibosheth is working with is a world in life view. He sees, he knows who he is before David. He knows who he is before God. And he expresses that. He says to Ziba, you know what? Take it. Take it. I know who I am. I know where I am before God. He's developed a world in life view. Now, how do we build that world in life view? Here's the start of it. This is from Melinda Eichhorn from Gordon College. She wrote a wonderful paper about listening to the stories of people with disabilities. And she says this, and we've said this before, but she's, she says it with a slightly different tack. Persons with disabilities remain in a mission field that, that's an, it's untouched, mostly. It is a mission field, we've been hearing that all along. But then she adds, and an untapped resource. We need to listen to the stories of people with disabilities. Listening to my cheering squad here <laughs> helped me remember that I don't need to be an activist. 
helped me to remember that I didn't need to be gun ho Helped me remember that my identity lied in Christ. These people made me a much better pastor than I started out being, and I am forever grateful for that. But we build that world and life view through three ways. Finding kononia. We talked a lot about inclusion and belonging here. I like to use the biblical term, kononia. Koinonia is a much deeper sense of community. Your identity in Koinonia comes from God. It's a deeper, richer, my pastor in Grand Rapids says, calls it a thick fellowship. Let's read John 1, uh, 1 John, John 1, uh, verse 3. We have seen and heard and proclaimed to you that you may have fellowship, the word there is Koinonia, with us, and indeed your fellowship in the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. The rest of the world talks about inclusion. That's fine. I've got no problem with that. But in the Christian church and disability ministry, it should be about kononia. This last speaker talked wonderfully about building a community, and he was describing kononia. And that's what we need. A, a deeper relationship, realizing we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, realizing our gifts to express to the kingdom of God. Two thoughts I'd like to share about that. One, God calls you, and he equips you. He doesn't call you according to your abilities. He doesn't call you, certainly, according to your disabilities. He calls you. He called Moses, who can't, didn't know how to speak. He called Paul, who had a thorn in his side, whatever that may be. And he equipped him. He equips us. He equipped me with all my disabilities. He equips the entire team, despite the, it, as sometimes despite and sometimes because of their disabilities. But he equips us. Also, here's a thought I'd like to share. We talk a lot about normal people accepting people with disabilities. Well, the reverse is also true. People with disabilities also have to accept you. You have to be accepted by them. It's not just a matter of raising a person with disabilities up so they can be a, you know, in your family, but also understanding where they are and becoming part of their family. That's Kononia. Did I go? Sorry. Now I'm accustomed to using these clickers. Uh, thirdly, learn to forgive. As Christ forgave. Luke 23, 34. Jesus is on the cross. The flesh has been beaten off his, literally off his body. He's hanging in the hot sun. He's been spit at. He's been ridiculed. He doesn't strike out. He doesn't lash out. He doesn't curse his enemies. He doesn't become an activist. He says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Now, when I talk about forgiveness, I'm not talking just about the people who bullied us with disabilities. I'm not talking just about them. We need to forgive them as well. But we also need to forgive the pe pe people who we've always run into in our lives with disabilities who say, oh, you do so well. Oh, you're a very special person. Some of us get angered with that. These are kind words that kind of come out of left field a little bit. We need to forgive that as well. We need to forgive all the times college counselors are going to say to you, I don't think you could handle that. I have got stories from campus pastors, colleagues who have talked about, she's in a wheelchair. She can't be a nurse. She would, it'd be a kinder thing to dissuade her from being a nurse because she's in a wheelchair. I don't want to set her up for, for a disappointment. That's a recent story. That's not long ago. Or well, stories about, oh, I know you don't understand this because of your disability. 
But here's what I have to say. We get all these kind acts that are couched in kindness, and they are, they are intended to be kind, but they come off, a, they rub us a long way. These are the people, we have to forgive those folks as well. In our ministry, we talk not so much about disabilities. If you come and sit at a table, I'm assuming you're coming to a table because either you know somebody with disabilities or you have disabilities yourself. So we start the conversation off the same way I think Christ would start the conversation off. What are your gifts? Your disabilities are obvious. What are your gifts? What can you bring to the body of Christ? What can you bring to the kingdom of God? What can you do to the glory of God? That's a much, much more important question. First John, again, and this is the, from the title of, of this talk that I gave. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should, we should be called the children of God, and so we are. The reason the world does not know us as it does, it did not, does not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. Important words right now. What we are has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who hopes, who thus hopes in him, purifies himself as he is pure. We're not quite, God's not finished with us yet, but not quite as we've appeared. God's not done with us yet. So let God work in you. And in conclusion, I'd like to remember, if you're thinking about college, it's really, really worth pursuing. If your son or daughter is going to college, if you're a campus pastor, it's challenging, but it's well worth it. Thank you.